You know, we were just talking about private equity with David Rubenstein um, about an hour ago and sort of the opportunities here in Asia. So tell me specifically, I mean, I know you're in hotels, you're in, you know, you're in commercial properties. What's most attractive to you right now? Right now, I think the hospitality space in Asia in particular is quite interesting because you do have a very large and growing middle class in China. And in the Instagram days, we have people love to acquire experience, right? So, <laughs> right. so actually, even in China, we're seeing a lot of the younger population much more interested in uh, spending money on travel versus just spending money on material goods, right. which is a good thing. That means they're out there acquiring uh, experiences, and they're acquiring experiences in a way because it's the Instagram moment. So then how do you how do you translate acquiring experiences to actual hard properties here then? How do you make So I think hospitality will do very well. Right? Okay. A lot, a lot of, you're going to see, I think last year there was 133 million outbound tourists in China, and that's increasing every year by 10 to 15 to 20 percent. And that's going to translate into tourism for Australia. We, we heard from Kevin Wright this morning about how Australia is welcoming uh, with both arms about the Chinese tourists, the Chinese spending. Southeast Asia has a lot of uh, interesting resorts for people to visit. Right? A lot of our culture, rich culture, rich history, rich towns for a lot of Chinese to visit. And I think they will start discovering those instead of just Europe and U.S., which is a long way away. Um, visa is not getting easier yeah. uh, parts of the world. And, um, I, th I think close to town, you can see a lot of opportunities. Domestic travel and also uh, travel within Southeast Asia. What about the U.S.? U.S., I think it's always U.S. We're big investor in U.S. in the um, creative sector, we, are, we like to say, because the millennials, are, it's the biggest population in, uh, in this era. And then they're actually changing, or the lifestyle, or the way they behave is changing because of everyone having a smartphone in their pocket. Right. And that behavioral change is actually leading to how they're consuming real estate in a different, in a different way. But it's also about the experience, right, in the it's U.S. It's also about the experience, yeah. right? So you're seeing pretty interesting changes in office sector. You're seeing pretty interesting change in uh, retail brought about by e-commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, it's disruptive, but when it's disruptive, you also have opportunities. But do you find more opportunities in Asia versus in the U.S.? Do you find that, you know, David was saying, like, valuations are much cheaper here, uh, for instance, in Asia? I think it's different, right? In, in Asia, you're betting on growth. Yes, it has political risk depending on whether you know how to navigate or not. If right. you know how to navigate, it's actually an opportunity. So Asia is about growth. U.S. is about, I think, shift lifestyle shift, which does create disruption, which even in real estate, a relatively boring asset class, um, it's, the, the, the new generation is going to consume it as a different kind of product. Mm. So for those who can transform and morph and create niches out of and, and, and make the way real estate is being consumed as a different kind of product, right. would potentially have an opportunity. Do you buy the um, doomsday scenarios people have put forth about a crash in Chinese property prices, that Chinese property is in a bubble right now? You know, a crash is, the way a crash happens always necessitated, necessitated by a bubble burst, right? A bubble burst means there has to be an instigator. Instigator is always dead, right? As, as, as distressed real estate investor, we always get our best deals when there's a massive correction. Mm. But correction comes from too much debt. China, you just don't have a lot of debt, at least in the retail market. It's the banks are cutting back liquidity significantly because the government contract is with the people. They want to manage manageable growth so that every day is a little bit, or tomorrow is a little bit better than today. Right. But that's what, that's a contract. And too much of the country's wealth is tied up in bricks and mortars. But Chinese people, whether you are Chinese in Singapore, or Chinese in Hong Kong, or Chinese overseas, we love bricks. We believe in putting our savings in bricks versus putting our money in the bank. But that's the nature of Chinese. If you believe in that, you realize that so much of the wealth in China or people's wealth are now tied up in real estate. So the government, that's why the government is so, um, in terms of trying to come into the market quite early and try to correct the market when the property price is going up too before fast, it goes too, before yeah, it goes too before hot. It goes too far. And if it drops too quickly, they're going to look bad with their contract to the people and they're going to have to try to figure out how to stimulate it yeah. before it becomes a crash. Are hotels, investing in hotels, you know, is it the way it used to be? Meaning, you know, how much has it changed in the face of new technology, right? How much has it changed, 
in the face of you know the Airbnbs of the world, right, or um, uh, or the local Airbnb uh, type company in China. I mean, you know, is it like it was like it used to be investing in hotels, or is it much harder? I think it's much harder, right? Uh, because if you are uh, almost in everything, real estate is, I always say we're in a boring industry, but even in a boring industry, <laughs> um, disruption is coming. You got to constantly, if you are a commodity, you're going to be in trouble, right. right? If you're a commodity retail, you're going to be absolutely disrupted by e commerce. If you are commodity in office, we work is coming where they're going to offer on demand spaces that are more interesting with all more amenities. Right. So, how do you not be a commodity then? Offer a different experience, right? You're selling an experience. You've okay. got to package your way where you're not just a, if you are just a commodity hotel, if your rooms are just a commodity, you are getting disrupted by Airbnb. Mm -hmm. right? But if you are selling an entire package, an exciting experience, whether it's a neighborhood experience, right? Your hotel is so looped into the neighborhood. When someone sees that they are actually experiencing the entire neighborhood through your hotel as a starting point, then it's a package experience that's not easily commoditized by being sold online. Right. Then it becomes unique and it becomes unique for the customer. Right. And that's the value proposition.